When you get an external impression of some pleasure, guard yourself, as with impressions in general, against being carried away by it. Nay, let the matter wait upon your leisure, and give yourself a little delay. Next, think of the two periods of time. First, that in which you will enjoy your pleasure, and second, that in which, after the enjoyment is over, you will later repent and revile your own self, and set over against these two periods of time how much joy and self-satisfaction you will get if you refrain. However, if you feel that a suitable occasion has arisen to do the deed, be careful not to allow its enticement and sweetness and attractiveness to overcome you, but set over against all this the thought, how much better is the consciousness of having won a victory over it? In chapter 34, Epictetus is providing us with some useful advice that has to do with a certain kind of appearance, something that's coming to us from the outside. And it's the appearance, as he says, of a pleasure. And things that we find pleasant, or at least we believe to be pleasant because they're presenting themselves to us in that way, and they may actually be pleasant, those things awaken and orient our desire, our erexus. Now remember back to chapter 2 where Epictetus said, the promise of desire is that you will get what it is that you want. That is what appears good to you, and pleasure seems to be a mode of goodness. So this is something that we encounter every day, and we, if we're going to live a stoic life, we have to really be on guard against it. That doesn't mean that we rule out every pleasure uh, per se, but we need to think through what, what's being presented to us. And so Epictetus gives us some, some useful pointers here. He says, when you get an external impression of some pleasure, right? Something is coming to you and saying, hey, this would be pleasant. That, that, that's going to taste great. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to indulge yourself in, in, you know, sitting in the sun and just relaxing and not doing any work? Hey, why don't you go over there and, and uh, have a cigar, you know, in, in my case, right? Sit down and have a cigar and maybe a coffee and just, just enjoy yourself. So he says, guard yourself. Take care of yourself. As with impressions in general, so this is, a, this is a general idea, against being carried away by it. When we allow ourselves to just uh, respond to stimuli that we're not even really sure about, we in effect reduce ourselves beyond the level of the, the human. We, we're not taking advantage of the fact that we not only have a, a faculty of choice, that's free, that, that at least in respect of things that really fall within its purview, but that we're capable of governing ourselves because we're able to reflect on things and we're able to say yes and no in ways that other animals can't. So he goes on and he says, instead, let the matter wait on your leisure. Give yourself a little delay. Now, think about it. If we personify the external things that confront us and say, hey, wouldn't you like to you know, engage with me? There's a cake over there. Wouldn't you like to eat me? There's you know, an opportunity over there. Wouldn't you like to, to enjoy me? Um, these things are trying to make us hurry up. And it's sort of like the ultimate con game. You know, con artists don't want you to think too long about what's going on. They want you to make a decision right away. Because if you, you know, if you think about it and you reflect on it and you start analyzing things, you'll be like, wait a second, what about this that you're saying here? This doesn't actually hold up. And it's the same thing with pleasures. They, they want us to act on them right away, or at least they present themselves in that, that sort of way. I'm personifying them. Instead, it's really us. We have a tendency within ourselves to feel rushed. Oh, I better take advantage of this right now. And, of course, we live in a culture that long ago learned that lesson and uses that as a sales pitch to us for so many things. You've probably heard of FOMA, which is fear of missing out. Um, that's something that gets played on quite a lot. And sometimes people don't even need to have outside things, you know, impinging on them that way. They've already got it so ingrained in their character that they're constantly on the lookout. So just take a little pause. Take a little break. This is always good advice. If you want to be prudent, 
you want to proceed in a deliberate manner. So he says, okay, you've given a little pause. Now think. What should you think about? Think about two periods of time. First, that in which you will enjoy your pleasure, and second, that in which after the enjoyment of it is over, you will later repent and revile your own self. And the word here for repent is actually the verb metanoesis. Um, you will have a change of mind. It's, it's the same word, by the way, that's used for repentance in religious literature coming from about the same time as Epictetus. So if you consider these two time periods, the time period in which you will be enjoying the pleasure, and we'll use a couple examples to illustrate this, and the time period afterwards where you'll be like, oh, that really wasn't worth it. Well, what was I thinking? Then um, that will help put this in perspective. So let's think, for example, about um, something that many people are, are confronted with, um, cheating in, in a monogamous, monogamous relationship, right? I uh, almost said mahogany there for a second. So a monogamous relationship, you're supposed to uh, be faithful to each other. And that's a very important value for Stoics. Uh, it has to do with justice. And let's say that you actually do have the opportunity to cheat. Uh, you have a one-night stand or something like that. If you do that, um, hopefully it'll be quite pleasurable because that's the only reason to do it. And it's not even a good reason, but that's the only real reason to do it. I suppose you could say oh, you want to stick it to your, your, your you know, spouse or partner and make them you know, jealous. Or, but those are terrible reasons, right? Um, so how much pleasure are you going to get? It's probably not that much. When you compare it to a much longer period in which you're going to feel bad about it, in which you have to worry about what if this other person finds out, in which you have to think about the fact that you threw away fidelity, a, 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 you know, a very high value. You damaged your person, and you probably damaged your relationship with the person who presumably you care about more. Let's use another example. Eating, right? Uh, you go to the buffet. This is an example I use quite a lot. You go to all-you-can-eat buffet, and you have your first course, right? Now you say, well, you know, I'm still not quite full. I'm going to go have a second course. And there's a lot of nice things out there on the, on the buffet. And you've eaten enough. You can actually feel that you've eaten enough. But you look out there, and there are the appearances, right, of tasty things, things that will give you pleasure. And you're like, you know, a third wouldn't really hurt me. I don't do this that often. Let's go do it. And so you load your plate up and you come back and you, you, know, you eat your food. Um, okay, so there's a certain pleasure there, usually followed by some pain, perhaps some repentance, particularly if you're trying to stay you know, trim or if you're actually trying to lose weight or anything like that. Uh, it's not healthy to eat like that. And so, you know, you balance these out. If you do that, it'll help you to make the decision, no, no, the pleasure, it is pleasure, but it's not really worth it compared to what I have to encounter afterwards. So he goes on and he says, there's another consideration too. Against these two other periods of time, set how much joy and self-satisfaction you will get if you refrain. And again, these are actually verbs here. Um, to, to, to rejoice, how, how much you will rejoice, and means how much you will praise yourself. It's not just that you'll feel self-satisfaction, it's that you'll say things to yourself like, hey, buddy, you did it. You stood up against pleasure, and that's a tough thing to do. You're actually making some progress. Instead of having negative self-talk, you'll have positive self-talk. Now, if you balance that, if you balance the first two out, and then you throw in this, this third consideration, that really tips the scale, and that should help you. And the more that you do it, the more you make a practice of this, the more it's going to help you. But notice what you have to do first. You have to take a pause before you can do any of this. So he says, um, however, if you do feel a suitable occasion has arisen to do the deed, be careful not to allow its enticement and sweetness and attractiveness to overcome you. But set over against all this the thought, how much better is the consciousness of having won a victory over it? Self-control, freedom are higher values 
than mere pleasure for Stoics. And so this is a very practical way here in the Enchiridion for a person to go about reasoning their way, practically reasoning their way to the right decision. When you do a thing which you have made up your mind ought to be done, never try not to be seen doing it, even though most people are likely to think unfavorably about it. If, however, what you are doing is not right, avoid the deed itself altogether. But if it is right, why fear those who are going to rebuke you wrongly? When we do things, we ought to be resolute in doing them. We ought to see them through and not really worry about what other people think because we don't control what other people think. So Epictetus is going to tell us when we're supposed to be doing something, uh, when we've got something that we've made up our mind ought to be done, we shouldn't try to not be seen doing it. And this is often the case when we have conflicted emotions about it or conflicted loyalties, when we're, we, we want to live the Stoic life and, and we want to follow through on our duties, and yet at the same time we, we do actually care about what other people think or about our self-image or about what the repercussions might be, when really those are externals and they shouldn't matter. They do matter for many of us, but we should try to pare them down. We, we have to make an effort to push them away, those sort of considerations. So he says to us, um, don't try to not be seen doing it, even though most people are likely to think unfavorably about it. So, you know, for example, if you decide that uh, you should exercise and lose some weight, and that means going to the gym and putting on your t-shirt and your shorts and your, your, you know, running shoes or whatever, and going on the machines and huffing and puffing and uh, being out of shape and having other people look at you like, oh, what, what's going on with that fat guy, that slob or something like that? Don't worry about what they think. That, that's not your concern. Your concern is the task that you should be doing. If you've got an embarrassing family member who you feel that you need to be there to support, you go and support them. Don't worry about what other people think about you. Uh, for coming in and hanging out with them. Likewise, a friend, likewise, a colleague. You know, if you're in a business meeting and somebody's saying something that's untrue and you think that you need to correct it, perhaps it isn't your place to correct it, but perhaps it is, then go ahead and do it. And don't worry about, you know, whether somebody else is not going to invite you to the next meeting. It's important if something really is your duty that you do it and don't worry about other people's viewpoints about it. Now he says as well, if however what you're doing is not right, that's a different thing, then avoid the deed itself altogether. If, if you think that something is wrong, and one of the reasons why we avoid doing certain things when other people can see us is, well, we think, oh, they're going to see us doing something wrong. From the Stoic perspective, if you're doing something wrong, you're doing something wrong. It doesn't matter if other people see you. It doesn't matter if you're all by yourself. It's wrong, it's wrong. So if it's wrong, just don't do it. That should be sort of a, a no-brainer. Now, it's much more difficult than that in real life, right? Because when, we want, when we're tempted to do something wrong, there's all sorts of other reasons that are suggesting themselves to us. You know, in this, this time, I know it's wrong, but I'm going to make an exception here and I'll never do it again. You know, we have to rule those, those sort of things out. We have to learn how to resist those false reasonings about it. If it's wrong, don't worry about what other people think. Just don't do it. Then he goes on and he says, if it's right, why are you going to fear those who are going to rebuke you wrongly? If, if they have a wrong-headed view about what it is that you're doing, that's the right thing to do, that's their problem. And maybe they can sort that out. Maybe you can explain it to them but you're probably not going to get through to them most of the time. And whether or not you get through to them, that's up to them. That's their issue. That's in their control. It's not something that you need to be overly concerned about. Just as the propositions, it is day and it is night, are full of meaning when separated, but meaningless if united, so also granted that for you to take the larger share at a dinner is good for your body, Still, it is bad for the maintenance of the proper kind of social feeling. 
When, therefore, you are eating with another person, remember to regard not merely the value for your body of what lies before you, but also to maintain your respect for your host. I think chapter 6 can be a little bit confusing for people first reading the Enchiridion because you might not see the connection between the first part of it, this stuff about day and night and propositions, and then talking about you know dinner and, and, and what's, what's your share and all that. So what, what is the connection between those? In a word, it has to do with what we call conflict or contradiction. The, the Stoics, Epictetus in particular, are going to talk in terms of what's in Greek, mache. And mache literally means battle, right? Um, it comes to mean later on any sort of conflict. So when we talk about having internal conflicts, like you don't know how to behave in a certain way, or you've got these mixed emotions that are kind of jarring against each other, or you're conflicted, what we often say, within yourself about how you ought to behave, that's what we're talking about. And this can happen in terms of logical order and propositions and arrangements and you know, all that sort of stuff. And it can also happen in terms of ethical matters. And as it turns out for the Stoics, these are actually interfused with each other. Because the way in which we carry out practical reasoning, that is, the way in which we reason about what, what is to be done, what is to be avoided or prevented, what's good, what's bad, how to, how to evaluate goods and bads against each other, all of that is not simply governed, but, but it sort of overlaps with logical structure. So he starts out talking about propositions, right? Uh, what are these propositions? It is day and it is night, right? So these are, these are contraries to each other, or at least opposites. It can't be day and night at the same time. And you say, wait a second, what about twilight? What about dawn? Okay, there's some limit cases there. Don't worry about that so much. Think about noon and midnight, right? Noon and midnight, both are 12, but they're not the same thing at all. And so Epictetus says, um, this is how it's translated. Just as the propositions, it is day and it is night, are full of meaning when separated from each other, but meaningless if united. Now, the Greek terms here um, is, is to say that, you know, instead of saying meaningful, it's eche axion megale. That is, they have great value. They have, we could say they have great meaning, great significance. They mean something real. It's day. Right now that I'm filming this, it actually is day. That's a true proposition. Why? Because the sun is, is, is out. Uh, if I were to do this 12 hours from now, uh, or maybe 15 hours from now, just make it you know, hedge our bets a little bit, it would be nighttime. And my saying it is day would be a clear falsehood, right? You like open the, <clears throat> the blinds and you show me the dark and you say, no sun out here, right? Well, look, at there's the stars. It's nighttime, buddy. So those things are meaningful when they're, they're separated from each other. They're not as meaningful. They're actually contradictory when we join them together into a single compound proposition. It is day and it is night. Or if it is day, it is night, like a hypothetical proposition or anything, anything along these lines. Or it is, it is day... Uh, uh, because it's night. Well, okay, the, this is sort of nonsense, right? Or, or at least it's not complete nonsense. We understand what the words mean, but that, that doesn't make any, any real sense. You can't say those sorts of things and have anybody go along with it. Now, in ethical matters, it works kind of similarly, except that it's not quite so straightforward. It's not quite so on the surface when there is a contradiction. But a great part of what Stoic ethics consists in is trying to work through these contradictions, trying to say, if there's a contradiction here, we need to make sense of this and, and you know, figure out which part we can keep. Usually when there's a contradiction, you can't have both sides. <clears throat> and where we get into a lot of trouble is in you know, the proverbial trying to have our cake and eat it too. Uh, that means trying to have things both ways. 
usually I'll, that, that'll also mean trying to impose something on the universe that the universe isn't going to go for, trying to do that to some other person. So he says, um, here's the other example from this passage. Granted that for you to take the larger share at a dinner is good for your body, still it's bad for the maintenance of the proper kind of social feeling. Um, the, the Greek for this is to, uh, to koinonikon, um, the, you know, the harmony, the community, you might say, the sharing. So you can't have both of these. It is good for your body to take more food. Probably. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're at a dinner and there's like unlimited food, no, it, that's not good for your body. But if you're at a, a typical dinner party where people have, uh, you know, laid out quite a bit, but the portions can, can be kind of small, then yeah, it would be good for your body to do that. So that's good in one sense, right? That's sort of like the day. But on the other hand, if it's a goal for you, if it's a desire, if it's a value, to preserve the fellow feeling, the community that you've been brought into at the dinner party, then that's not compatible. And that's the, it is night, right? And you can't have both of these at the same time. It's good for your body. It's bad. It's, it's good for the body. It's good for the community. Um, these can't be reconciled in this particular instance. Now, of course, you know, if, if, they planned out the dinner a little bit differently, maybe it would be. But he says, when therefore you're eating with another person, remember, this is the important point, remember, direct your mind to pay attention, not merely the value for your body of what lies before you, but also to maintain your respect for your host or for your fellow partakers in the dinner, your fellow diners, right? And we can say this about so many other things as well. Think about relationships. You want to have a good relationship with your boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, partner, spouse, whoever it is. Well, there's certain things that you can't do then and certain things that you need to do. And if you're going to maintain, yes, I want to have a great relationship. I want to, you know, have this loving back and forth reciprocal relationship. Well, then you can't monopolize the conversation time. And maybe you like mo monopolizing the conversation time. If you're a big talker, right? You, you love to talk. You like to be listened to. Oh, well, then if you're going to favor this, you cannot favor this. That's similar to the if you want to favor your body, you can't favor what's good for the community, what's good for the host. We can say this in general on a much larger scale about something that the Stoics recognized as an integral part of human nature. As animals as animate beings, particularly as animals that can think ahead about things, we uh, do in fact try to do what will conduce to our living well, not just surviving, but I increasing our life, making our life better. Sooner or later, if we follow that out exclusively, that can run into other people's trying to do the same thing. And the Stoics say that we not only have this as a value, but we also have living in harmony with other people and being in community, being social as a value as well. Sometimes these are not compatible with each other. For you to take the best of everything or to try to impose your will on everybody else, that's not compatible with uh, being in harmony with other human beings, having a fabric of good relationships with them, living in a community. And so at one point or another, we, may, we need to make a decision for one of these. We have to consider, we have to call to mind and say, wow, I've been acting like a jerk for all this time. I, I need to start making this the priority and pairing this away, maybe even making up for it. Or perhaps uh, you could say, uh, screw the community. I, I'm only interested in myself. You wouldn't be a good stoic then, but that's, that is a, a live possibility for people. So this uh, hopefully makes this, this passage much more clear to you.